Welcome to Raising Consciousness with me, Lou Burrows, where raising human consciousness happens. On this show, I'm joined by guests to cover a range of topics and have conversations that will raise human consciousness for current and future generations. Now, let's dive into today's show. Hey everyone, welcome back to Raising Consciousness with me, your host, Lou Burrows. And today on the show, we have a very special guest, uh, Joel Green, who is joining us from the States, I believe. Uh, Joel, welcome to Raising Consciousness. Thank you for coming on the show today. Hey, Luke, thanks for having me on. No problem. Hey, so, the States as well, yeah. yeah, yeah, awesome. Awesome, that's good, man. Um, so, I believe that you are the CEO of Pro Level Training and National Director of uh, Nike Sports camp a former professional basketball player and motivational speaker so it sounds like you know you've you've done a lot you do a lot like um talk us through who is joel ultimately and then yeah we'll dive more into the the content that we have today yeah man it's uh been in quite a few lanes uh different industries uh i've been you know a part of quite a bit throughout my life you know playing basketball the bulk of my life was the the primary thing for me mm. uh had some some rough uh sides of, of life that i experienced early on and just do my best to work to smooth things out throughout my life man and, and picked up a whole lot along the way uh, a ton of principles from sports from playing division one basketball you know which is the highest level and then playing professional basketball at the highest level i just it's a lot of principles that i have taken from those things, from that side of life that I now apply in business, you know, being the CEO of a company, working along with Nike and, you know, working along with the youth at the same time by way of our camps that we put on. So um, as I do that, I'm able to speak to kids and even away from being around the youth, I'm able to speak to adults through by way of my motivational mm-hmm. speaking, the TED talk and things like that. So um, I really enjoy all that I do. And with the many lanes, they all tie in honestly, and become one. So I don't feel like I'm widespread at all because they're all pretty much toward the same objective and goal, which is influence. I love that. And so I want to touch on your professional, um, like athlete sporting career first, because like, so I'm a huge football fan. So that'd be soccer for you. Um, cause I'm, I'm here in the UK mm-hmm. and, um, it's, it's, it's interesting. Like from the outside, I feel that people think that and maybe this is just my perception, my, my perspective that being a professional athlete, a professional sports person is, um, is easy, you know, like, especially, uh, so, so, you know, so often it gets talked about, you know, with just using the example again, with, with football players, like they get paid so much, like it's so easy, like, but I just actually like talk us through like the, all of the determination and dedication and, and that goes into like owning your craft and being a professional sports person. Like I, I, I really, um, wanted to share this with people because, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure it's a lot, I'm sure there's a lot of sacrifice and, and, and then that is worth it. But like, just to kind of open people's minds to actually what it's, what it's like. Yeah. Th- there's so many levels to professional athletics, you know, even uh, a forgotten component that's never discussed is the fact that we're actually entertainers. You know, Mm -hmm. uh, the same way you would go to pay to go see an opera, any, a ballet, a show, you know, you're amongst a crowd, right? And you're seeing people do their profession on a stage. It's the same way when you're a part of a crowd watching a a football game, or if you're going to, you know, watch, Mm -hmm. you know, any game, um, you're in a crowd watching people perform on a stage to entertain you know, those in the crowd. So we have to show up to properly entertain this audience of people. So that's a part of our profession that's never discussed. Like professional athletes are actually entertainers as well. And if it's a bad performance, you know about it, you know what I mean? And you know about it right away. The same way if a singer at a concert was just simply there to perform and they did a bad job singing, you know, it's like, oh, well, that was a bad show or that was a bad game when it comes to athletics. But as far as the outside, everything outside of that, athletics professionally, it's a 24-7 job um, because unlike other professions, you know, that doesn't require a bunch of physical 
actions and activity, you have to watch and monitor your body, what you eat, what you consume, what you're around, just to make sure you're at your optimal state once it's time to perform. So, you know, you have to make sure you get to sleep earlier than most people a lot of times, you know, especially while you're in season. All seasons is a different story, but you're you know, when you're in season for those six or seven months, you got to get to sleep on time, got to eat right. The discipline is amazing. It's a different level of discipline um, and restriction. It's a lot of restriction um, that comes along with being a pro athlete. Because again, once you reach a certain level, you're getting paid top dollar. And if whoever's paying you is making sure you're doing your part to earn that top dollar. So you have to make sure you monitor your diet. You have to make sure you continually work on your game multiple times a day. And it's not an easy thing. But, you know, the, the fun part about it is, I'll be honest, it is still a game, right? But it's not an easy game to maintain. It's hard because it gets even more competitive once you reach that level. So you have to work even harder once you get there. So athletes may make it look easy when the lights are on for those two to three hours, but it's not. It's a, it's a lot of prep <laughs> that goes into things before the game even comes around. And would you say it's worth it? Like all of the sacrifice, all of the discipline from your career, would you say like all of that, all said and done, it was worth it? Oh, I can't say it enough. Uh, it's more than mm -hmm. worth it because it also makes, you know, again, as an athlete, it makes, it's, it's a nice duality to it, to where it keeps you healthy. I'm just being honest. Mm -hmm. So the harder you work, the healthier you stay, you know, and it helps build you know, a great acumen to just great nutrition, great health, and that discipline can stay with you for the rest of your life. So it was, it was more than worth it. I, I loved it too. Just as with any walk of life, you become accustomed to it. You get used to it. So it wasn't like I ever said, oh, my profession is harder than your profession. No, I just got used to it. So people may have said, oh, it's just easy for you. No, that's not the case. I'm just used to it because I've been doing it for so long. And I may not want to get used to being an accountant. I may say, oh, that's hard. But an accountant may say, no, your job is hard. They're used to their job. I'm used to my job. And I just, I, I, I loved it, man. The off season training from nine, to, you know, nine to 11 hours a day. That was my, my way of life. I started my day at 4.30 a.m. to go out to the track first, do conditioning, then go to the weight room. That was just my way of life. Again, that's the side that's never seen on YouTube or seen on TV, but waking up at 4.30 in the morning while it's still dark for the next three hours and starting your day as an athlete during the off season, um, it's not publicized, but that's a part of our, our job. Yeah. Uh, I find it like fascinating the like the things that go on behind the scenes that no one, that no one sees in terms of like the, the criticism part that, you know, uh, especially like the media mm -hmm. and obviously fans can, can pick, can pick up on, like talk us through how that can affect an athlete potentially, you know, obviously you got, I feel like again, from being on the outside, you gotta be quite thick skinned and, um, you know, get your mind right mm -hmm. and just kind of block all that out. But is there times when in your career where, you know, the, those outside voices, has it, has it cooked in? Because, it, you know, at the end of the day, we are human beings and, you know, we're not um, perfect. And so I'm, I'm curious if, if you or, or maybe any of your teammates or people that you know within, within the game, if that's happened. And yeah, just kind of like, how, how you deal with that? How you manage with that? Well, again, I, I speak on this, you know, I've spoken on this enough as far as when it comes to sports, professional sports, it is different from... Almost, no, it's different from every other job in this aspect. People are allowed to come to your job and call you names, and it's okay. They can curse at you, and it's okay. They can just literally talk about your family, and it's okay. Um, it's not regulated. They can literally, to your face, as close as they can get a seat to, to the floor, to the field, they can curse at you, they can do whatever they want. And it's actually allowed, which is crazy to me because like you just said, we're still human. We hear this stuff. And no one can go into an office at somebody's job and call them names and it'd be okay. But why is it allowed in sports? So we, you know, that's something to where athletes are often seen as robots. Uh, they're just supposed to take it, they're pros. But we're human at the same time. 
So sometimes when you see a kickback from an athlete back at a fan, the athlete is often looked at as wrong. It's like, wait a second. They said racial things to me or they said X, Y, Z to me. And it's, that's not right. You shouldn't be able to come into my workplace and call me names. So you have to be thick skinned to be able to handle things like that and still perform at an optimal level, which, you know, athletes do every single night. And that's where it's overlooked a lot, you know, um, to where no matter what we hear, we still perform because we're trained to like, you know, we're trained, we train every day so that we can, no matter what we hear, honestly, no matter what crazy signs we see being held up with our names and disrespectful things on it, you have to just train yourself to still perform and be that focused and tuned into your job, your profession as much as possible. Yeah. I feel that. And, and so from your experience, like, is it, harder or more challenging when that when those criticism or just overall toxicity spreads over onto like more in like your personal life you know with like family and stuff because i you know your family hasn't choose you know this life you know like that was your career if that mm -hmm. makes sense you know so um right. and like like how do you deal with that because i i imagine that will that to be extremely difficult well, you know what, the, the, the way my mind works, the way my perspective is and the way I internalize things, the negativity is, is always made me work harder, to be honest with you, to shut those naysayers up. So the more negative feedback I got, I took it and said, OK, I'm going to shut that person up by working that much harder to improve to where they will have nothing to say. So I took it more so that way. And I know a lot of my teammates, a lot of my friends, different athletes I know, they take it the same way uh, by not complaining about it. But because we understand that a lot of people that does the complaining about our skill sets may have, have never even done what we are doing at that level. So they don't fully understand the, I don't know, you can even say the pressures or different things that occurs. Um, but we aren't, you know, no athlete, no pro athlete isn't is perfect. No, your favorite player isn't perfect. And most pro athletes realize that like, okay, they are saying all this stuff. They're talking trash. The newscasters, the sportscasters are saying we stink. We, we, we're not good, but we have to understand, okay, let's prove them wrong. Let's go out there, work harder and actually make them, you know, be quiet about those same things. They uh, once disrespected us about. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. In terms of like applying the lessons you've learned within your sporting career to, to business, like what are some of those lessons? And a lot of, I, again, like I'm a huge sports fan here in the UK. And so um, I tend to, but I'm like on the outside, you know, some kind of like a, yeah, like passionate fan, I guess. Um, but, you know, mm -hmm. I hear stories yeah. of, of like, of that transition from, playing days to retirement and that, that actually being really hard for athletes because they dedicated so much of their life to the game that they've fallen in love with ultimately and they, they've dedicated their life to and that transition mm -hmm. can be hard so i'm curious on like those two points the lessons that you've applied from sports to business if you feel like some aspects are the same and then uh your transition in into business and if that was something that was um a, a challenge for you and how you adapted well, I, you know, I, I'll start with that. You know, the transition was was it was difficult because I played a sport for over 20 years of my life. You know what I mean? You know, from from being a youth into, you know, my 20s, I played one sport, which was a sport that I love. And so by the time I made the choice to step away from it, I went through depression. I'm like, man, what do I do? I know that I'm more than an athlete, but man, in what way, what do I step into now? I knew I wanted to get into business and that was one of the main reasons why I stopped because I wanted to be home, you know, in, in, in the States, in America. I was playing abroad in Europe and in South America more often than not each year. And I, you know, I was getting married. I said, you know, okay, I'm getting married. Let me come back to America, stay here, start a company. But it was very difficult, man. You know, this is at this point over 10 years ago now, but I went through depression. I'm, I'm questioning life in a different way. Like, man, what do I do now? I'm used to having crowds chair my name or chair for me. And now I'm just not hearing that anymore. You know what I mean? You don't realize how much you get used to that. You know, I was used to traveling, going to different cities to play. And I was sitting still now. So 
I experienced a different level of anxiety that I never experienced before, insecurity that I never experienced before. It was like, whoa. And, you know, fortunately, I had some help. You know, I reached out to diff- different friends and different mentors, my parents, siblings, anyone I could that could help me. And just put my focus in the right way. Just started doing a lot of reading and researching on different things I can do in business and um, made it happen, you know, with God's help. So, you know, I thank God that I was able to figure things out because now I'm able to help coach other athletes that's transitioning out of their sport um, on different things they can do. I even bring them on board with my company to help them transition. But um, one of the main lessons I would say I've taken from sport and have relayed to business is to simply go to extra mile with everything that I'm working on, right? Like even my son who's nine years old knows uh, this mentality that I'm about to tell you about. So in college, one of my coaches, you know, I used to call him crazy all the time because he used to work us so hard, but we ended up winning a national championship with him Um, because of the hard work. He had, we had shirts that always said one more on it all capital letters with an exclamation point at the end of it. So <clears throat> anytime we had 10 repetitions of something, we would do our 10. Then he would say one more <clears throat> all, all the time, all the time. We knew it was coming sometimes. Sometimes we would forget. We would be so in tune with what we're doing. We'll forget. We'll knock out our 10. All right, guys, one more. We're already dead tired. One more. And that one more would end up being 17 or 18 after he said, let's do 10. But what that did for us was, we started to see everybody else around the country. They would only stop at 10. They did their 10 and they stopped. The coach had them do 10 and the coach would let them stop. Our coach wouldn't let us stop. He would make us go to where we couldn't go anymore. And that's how we separated ourselves from everybody else because we did the extra work, right? We didn't just do the standard of what was written in black and white in the books of training or the coaching books that says do 10 reps of this. We did 10, and then once he saw we were capable of doing more, he said, nope, one more, do another. And he would take us to he would take us to failure, and that was the best part about it. We began seeking failure, and every time we would just do more and do a little bit more, we separated ourselves from the competition, and we saw it game after game to where people couldn't hang with us anymore on the court. So even in business now, I relate to my team. Okay, I know that's what I said I wanted you guys to do. Hey, do one more. You know, go ahead and make one more call. Okay, just look that one more email. It might that might actually close the deal. So let's let's do one more thing tomorrow. So I'm trying to relay that same mentality to my partners in business, and I, I still carry it for myself. And like I said, even my son, he understands when I say, "All right, let's let's get one more shot up" or things like that. He gets it. I love that. Um, so a question that's coming to mind is. Um... And forgive me if I'm not articulating this clearly, I'm just kind of trying to pro- process it in my mind at the same time. But like, I'm, I'm curious about that because um, there was a guy who, a podcast that I was listening to, um, oh, what was his name? Um, he's a famous speaker as well. Um, oh, Ed Myler. Uh, Eric Thomas? Sure. Um, no, Ed Myler. Oh, Ed, Ed Myler, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yep. he, he basically had the same um me- like ideal like, like method you know like the the it's art like, of one more I, th- I think he like i don't know if he created mm-hmm. like a book or something on it or something um and i started to uh mm-hmm. apply it to my own life and you know and at, at the end of it you like actually realize what you're capable of you know like because sometimes you, you may stop at 10 but then you do the one more and you're like actually i i can keep going and so my question is like but like okay. at the same time how do how do we balance that with I, if it's a balance, how do we balance that with also listening to ourselves? Like, and what, so what I mean by that is listening to more of like our bodies as well. Um, because there's also probably the other extreme whereby we do so much that we burn out and that we don't recover properly, you know, and kind of more of that conversation. And so I'm fascinated by like these two, um, well, that extreme and then the the method that you're sharing that I've also applied to my life and kind of definitely see the value in it, you know, develops your character and uh, perseverance and everything. And so, um, yeah, like if, if you can, can you like talk to that from your experience and where you maybe see the difference? Well, I mean, what, I, what I've learned, especially when it comes to sports, you don't really get to know yourself until you test your limits, right? Like mm. you, yes, you know, burnout can happen. 
along the way, uh, just different things. But if you're trying to, you know, compete within that sport, you have to, you got to be daring, to being honest with you. So there is, like you mentioned, a balance, uh, but you don't learn that balance until you at least attempt to reach your wits in your, your threshold, your, your overall capacity and, and get to that point where it's like, okay, now I can tell I'm getting close. Let me, let me, let me stop. Let me stop for a moment. Let me take a breath. Let me hydrate now. Um, you have to try to test that out if you're trying to be your absolute best, right? That's just really what it comes down to. It's not a whole lot of in between. There's no fluff with it. If you want to become your best with something like that, you got to test your limits. That's the only way. And again, that one more mentality that I just spoke about, that's what it did for me. It, it literally helped me to see what I was no longer capable, to, capable of doing, you know, within a certain feat. I saw, okay, that's my threshold right there. Now I know uh, where my ceiling is. But for me, the, just the way I think, I want my ceiling to become my floor. So I'm always saying, okay, how far can I take myself? Now I know where that is. Now let me actually see if I can build on top of that even strategically in some form or fashion. So obviously carrying that same mentality from sports, now I'm doing it in business saying, okay, that was our threshold before. Yes, but it has to be a way to where we can build on that even. And that's that's really what it's about. You just got to be daring. You know, you got to take yourself mm -hmm. there. Sometimes that means sleeping less and working harder. But um, that's, that's really what it comes down to. Has there been anything that's, uh, I mean, obviously you've been in business now for, I think, like, is it 10, 10 years or so since the transition? So, uh, 11 um, now. Yeah. 11, 11. Okay, cool. So yeah. during that transition and obviously now being in business for 11 years, like, is there, has there been anything that's, I guess, like surprised you from that tr transition over from sports to, to business? <sighs> If anything, I would say what has surprised me is the fact that how closely related sports is to, you know, business period, you know, um, not so much even the business of sport to just being the business, you know, as far as corporate and other things like that, but just the, the principles of success that applies and easily just translates over into the world of business. The same way I won on the court. I'm able to win in business the same way, you know, the same principles, right? The same level of commitment. It's, it's not much that I've changed. I'll be honest with you, as far as what I did on the court and, and during my off seasons and training than I do right now. Now I'm just able to sit down and do it. I'm able to sit down and read and research versus being out there sweating so much um, and running and running around and jumping. So that is one thing that definitely surprised me, um, just how similar it is. It's, and I realized it's, it's, it's a formula, man. It's a formula that, that applies to every industry. No matter what you do, you apply that same formula. You can have success within that industry. I love that. Um, and I, um, I know that you have, or you, you're in the press, I know that you have your first book as well. Um, mm -hmm. Talk to us. Yeah, talk to us about that. Like from obviously athlete to, uh, to entrepreneur to now like an author, right? So like, I mean, an obviously speaker as well. Yeah. So like, to talk us through the journey of, um, of, of, of the book. Uh, and if you can, like some of the, obviously what the book's about and, and maybe, maybe like some of the, the top lessons that people can, can take away from the book and I will definitely link it down below in the show notes. So, um, yeah, yeah. If you're listening or watching to this episode, definitely uh, check out Joel's book, but yeah, like in, in the time that we have left, like, like talk, talk about the book. I'm really curious, um, about it, like how it came about. Um, and, and yeah, maybe like some of the, the main lessons that are in the, is, is in the book. Oh, no problem. Uh, yes. The, the book, my book is called filtering. The way to extract strength from the struggle. And it, it was a journey, man, a, a lifetime of living, you know, six plus years of writing. And, wow. you know, it, it sounds like a lot. And, um, 
there was quite a bit that I had to to really put in this book. Um, I there was a lot of dabbling the first four years of writing. I was just contributing content to this one huge word document that I had, and I got serious about it. You know, about two and a half years ago, uh, it actually started off the book with what got me serious about finishing this book. Um, but it came just by way of difficulty. I'll be honest with you. And I, it came during a period of time to where I was just questioning life, going through potential divorce and, you know, again, transitioning out of, uh, basketball and, and, and sports on, in that capacity. It was like, man, just who am I, you know, what do I do? How do I go about it? And I had so many questions, man. And I said, I, I just need an answer. So I began reading. I started reading nine books every three weeks, you know, for about three, you know, for about three months. It was just consistent. Every few weeks I was not, I had a whole stack of nine new books. I put myself on this reading schedule and I was just literally transforming. And uh, again, I was speaking, you know, from the stage as well. And I developed this method for myself to help myself not just get through my issues, but what I wanted to do, again, I'm a daring person. I wanted to use my issues, leaning to them and see if I can find a part of the issue that can actually help propel me to the other side of the issue. So it no longer bothered me. So I began leaning into my dark moments like I never had before in my life. And I came up with this method I call filtering for myself to really just break down my circumstances, my issues, my problems to make it more manageable for myself because I was overwhelmed. It's just, it was like, these big things that was bothering me. So I just needed to simplify life, filter them, break them down into honestly particles so that I can really comprehend them. And I began finding so much fruit, even within the difficulty. I began finding so much bonus and plus and great things and benefit within the problems. I was like, man, I actually don't want this problem to end just yet. It sounds crazy because I began finding the benefit and the lesson within the problem And I realized that's why the problem was here. It wasn't here to make me mad. It was actually here to improve me. So the moment I switched my perspective, I began realizing that all the difficulties and bad stuff in life is not here to make us mad or even here to have us fix those bad things. Those bad things are actually here to help improve us, to help refine us. And the moment I took on that perspective, I began really, my life changed immediately. I'll be, I'll be honest with you. Business changed immediately. Business started booming and growing. My life got better personally. And I just began really taking, writing this book serious. And um, that's one of the main things that the book will help people with. It's really helping them to switch their perspective, to learn the purposes of their pain, to you know really focus on the journey of different goals and objectives and not focusing on the goal itself. You know what I mean? Just really teaching people about the process of things, how to handle it. I talk about how I grew up in an abandoned house, you know, when I was younger in North Philadelphia. And, you know, I was six feet away from a, uh, excuse me, 10 feet away from a shooting when I was about six years old. And I was the only person there outside of the other, the kid that got shot. So I talk about things I overcame like that, tragically losing one of my older brothers, having a knife pulled out on me and called the N-word when I was nine years old. Like all these different things in the book, I talk about how I overcame them. And how I was able to succeed despite going through these things. So it's a very inspiring read, you know, uh, really helps people in the area of entrepreneurship as well. I put in there my whole blueprint of how I got into business, how I made partnerships with with Nike, how I made partnerships with other companies. It's all in there. So um, it's a great read for for anyone that's interested in it. And um, I'm big on feedback. I love to hear from, you know, the people guys reading it. I've been getting texts and DMs on social media and screenshots of people reading the book. I love that. I just want to know that it's helping to impact other people and help them out. I love that. So I definitely linked the the book down below. So yeah, if you're listening or watching to today's episode, obviously, thank you for joining us. But yeah, definitely check out Joel's book. One kind of point on that, Joel, is do you feel that um, people have a What's the word I'm looking for? I'm going to use the word complex kind of relationship with kind of pain, if that makes sense. Like something that like pain therefore is bad, so they avoid it, you know, and they they don't have that perspective of that actually um, using that 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 pain for purpose ultimately. And kind of building on that, I've kind of seen this um, a few times recently the difference actually between 
pain and um and oh, pain and suffering as well like there's there's a, there's a difference between pain and, and suffering i would love to hear your thoughts on mm -hmm. on both those uh points yeah i mean well you know pain is the is you can say is is it's not the full out cause but it, it's it's the initial phase of suffering right like suffering is like the ongoing uh <laughs> relative of pain um but at the same time again and this is depending if it's physical mental emotional you know you don't have to suffer suffering doesn't have to be attached to every single pain you know what i mean uh suffering again depending on what kind of pain is connected to suffering just may be the the mindset Sh suffering may be the improper perspective that's being held it may, suffering may be nothing but a perception right because if you took a different vantage point and looked at it from another way you may no longer be suffering that fast because you may be seeing it with the wrong lens through the wrong lens with the wrong heart and if you say oh wow now i'm seeing this thing working for me and not against me all of a sudden you're not suffering and that's what i, I teach people often is like okay you see suffering you feel suffering that's what you're focusing on the moment you switch your focus and say okay how, what can i actually get from this is there a purpose with this is there a seed of equivalent seed of a benefit just like i see that seed of negativity and, and pain then you'll start to realize okay this isn't all bad part of it may be a little bad but there's some good within it so um there's some it's a complex correlation for sure you know between pain and suffering and just an overall complex relationship with pain as you mentioned um it's complex because you know no one likes pain pain, pain hurts you're right like we wanted to leave immediately because it, it hurts but that's where i argue you may not want for all pain to leave right away without doing some assessment of that pain before it goes because what will happen is life especially pain is cyclic you know we're so many of the same patterns come back around back around back around and it's not until you learn the lesson from that painful pattern until you're able to move on from that that pattern resurfacing itself again later in life it's like a video game it's like you're not going to get past this level until you complete the objective of that lesson that keeps presenting itself once you overcome that then you can move on to the next level you can level up and that's how i look at pain if we don't address it while it's while it's here in some form or fashion it's going to resurface it's kind of like a an ailment right like the it's a doctor trying to help improve it they'll medicate it medicate it medicate it but you're not fully addressing the root cause of that pain you're just covering it up with medication so i want to get to the root of this to remove it so i can move on from this pain so i tell people that you ought to just lean into their pain a little bit more before it goes before you just force it out the door and ignore it as if it's not there so um that can be painful in itself though you know that, that can be a hurtful thing to have to lean into your pain you know emotionally that's, that's a difficult thing to do but it's a necessary thing to do if you don't want that pain to keep coming back again and again and again. And so two of the reasons that, um, for me that I've kind of seen and, and experienced myself again, because none of us are, are perfect, um, of, of like why that, why that may happen, you know, the pain keep coming back in and maybe like us not being able to learn from that experience in order you know, to grow and evolve, etc. I think from my experience, like, one point is just having a lack of kind of consciousness ultimately, which hopefully uh, shows like mine and stuff is the purpose of mm -hmm. to help, help, you know, raise consciousness. Right? Sure. And, and, and secondly mm -hmm. is, is actually sometimes like our ego can get in the way, you know? Um, oh, and so, um, yeah, like well, what are your thoughts, experiences with that? And, 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 and may, maybe some quick tips on like how people can recognize that and start to, to overcome that so they can you know grow and use their pain for their you know to transfer it into a purpose and again I, I mean what i'm about to say and this is not to plug my book at all but what i began doing with the whole filtering method that's what exactly what it did it helped bring about awareness you know uh to where i was able to break down 
the reason, one of the main reasons why we don't try to face our pain is because it can be overwhelming, right? It hurts and it can be overwhelming because pain can be big. And when I filter my circumstance and my problems and issues, it helps break everything down to where I can handle it. Because I'm, I'm human just like everybody else. So I know what it feels like to try to face my pain and it hurts. Like pain can hit back, you know? So the moment I began breaking it down, I realized I don't have to be Superman to handle this thing. I can actually break it down to where it's manageable for myself and just tackle a part of it. And once I tackle and went over that part of the pain, okay, now I can move on to the other part of the pain and just break it down into bite-sized pieces where I can actually consume it properly. So, you know, by way of filtering, you know, which is the, the method that I use for, you know, for myself and I've coached others to use it, it just really helps to bring about awareness in the moment, which is the best thing you need because you don't have to wait on hindsight in the future to reveal to you what you could have done in the moment. I'm not big on waiting on hindsight. I want foresight. I'd rather give, give me that so that I know what to avoid because I've already addressed this thing in the past. So that it, just the filtering method in itself really helps bring about an awareness, man. And that's that's been the fun part, the adventurous part for me. Um, I don't look, trust me, I don't look for problems. I don't look for pain. I don't want it to come. But that's life. And we, you know, we, we both know that things happen from day to day. And, you know, to have some type of protocol in place, it gives me peace. You know what I mean? Just to know, okay, if this were to happen or if I feel a certain way, hey, just filter it, man. Just filter it. And that's why, literally what I tell myself, hey, filter it, filter it. And it helps bring about an awareness because I get into an emotional brainstorming phase to where I, I'm able to see things from an objective point of view and not just from my own subjective point of view, which can hurt sometimes if I'm only seeing it through one lens. I love that. Um, I may just have to start using that myself, right? Just, just filter it, <laughs> filter it down. I love that. Um, John, yeah. so, um, in, in like the time we have left, like, do you have, uh, anything else that you would like to share with the audience today? Like maybe some words of wisdom, um, uh, actual steps that they can take away from the episode. Yeah. Um, anything else that you, you have to share? would love to, would love to share it with our audience today. Sure. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, just kind of, you know, have a perspective of the, the many difficulties. Make a list of the things, if you have to, that you complain about from day to day. Guys, like, you know what I mean? If there's things you complain about on a weekly basis and you can just see how redundant it is each and every week, complaining about this, complaining about it, make a list of it. And, and just and, and as, as you look at those things, see if there happens to be benefit in any of those things. Instead of only seeing it from the complaining side, from the negative side, take a look at each and every one that you've listed and say, is there anything that I can actually get from this instead of just complaining about it? Because guess what? If you're complaining about it each and every week, it's likely just a part of your life, which means you're going to have to deal with it. So choose to deal with it in a productive way to say, okay, if there's benefit in this thing, I'm going to get it from it. If there's a lesson within the thing, I'm going to get it from it. But you don't do that until you have to really lean into that thing and break it down and filter it and say, okay, ah, there it is. So if, there, if you do nothing else, be aware of your triggers. Be aware of the things that you complain about from day to day and see if there's something that you can actually get from those things. I mean, you're going through them. You might as well get something from them. And that's how I operate. And just keep in mind that so many of those things that's there that you complain about aren't always there to hurt you. So many of those things are there to help you. So mm -hmm. if that helps any of you guys, you know, um, trust me when I tell you, if you take that perspective and you challenge yourself to do that, believe me, you will get something from those things. I love that because, um, so, so something that I think about is that actually if we're in that state of mind of complaining, then we're just remaining where we are, right? We're just in that, that stuck mode because- right. We're not looking for solutions, right? We're not looking for ways potentially out of it or ways to grow, ways to evolve. And as you're saying, you know, sometimes the, our issues and, and challenges and, and, and I, to, put, to be honest, I hate the word problems because like, you know, it just, it just kind of keeps us stuck. I kind of like the, the word more of like a challenge, right? Because it, um, it has that for me that, uh, like if it's a challenge then it's going to motivate me to take action on it, to fix the, you know, to overcome the challenge and help me to grow in and evolve. Right. Whereas the, where it's like problems that, you know, it's like, oh, you know, I've got problems and it's very like low energy, low frequency, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, yep. So you you know I love I love everything that we're we're sharing and talking about and um, yeah, helping people to to filter it down. So yeah, thank you so much for yeah. your for your time today, my friend. Um, where can people connect with you? Find you online if they want to learn more about you, what you do. Obviously, the book is that from like Amazon. Yeah, um, share mm-hmm. away. Yeah, uh, you can find me on Instagram. I'm on there often, uh, and I love engaging with people. You know, I, I put up motivational posts each and every day and just look to encourage people as much as I possibly can. I love an engagement. So, you know, whether it be through comment section or if you guys DM me, I would love to get back to you. Uh, you can find me on there at J Green PLT. That's J A Y Green PLT. Uh, would love to connect with you guys. I'm also on Facebook at Joel Green Official. Uh, my website, joelbgreen.com. So anyway, you guys want to connect, I would love to connect with you. Amazing. Awesome. Uh, well, Joel, thank you so much today. I will link that all down below. I will also link the book so people can pick that up. Um, and yeah, my final thoughts would be, you know, guys, like definitely connect with Joel. Um, I love his, uh, well, I love everything that he shared with us today. And I think it's going to be super valuable to help you to move forward in, in your journey and uh, raise Raise your consciousness, right? Which is the whole part of the, of the show. So, yeah, thank you for joining me today, guys. And I will look forward to speaking to you all in the next episode. And for more after today's show, be sure to head on over to raisingconsciousness.show to get all of the show notes, transcriptions, videos for each episode, and a hell of a lot more. And if you got value from this episode, found it insightful or learned a thing or two, please leave a review where you can let everyone know that this show is worth checking out. I appreciate you so much. You'll be hearing from me in the next episode.